Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the National Repetitive Head Trauma Seminar, hosted by Marsh and Macquarie University. I'm Dean Mum, one of your hosts, a former Wallaby and current risk advisor for Marsh Insurance. I'd also like to introduce my uh, co-host for the day, Dr. Rowena Mobbs. Thank you, Dean. It's great to be here, isn't it? Yeah. And uh, well done last night. <laughs> yeah. State of origin, eh? um, My name's Rowena Mobbs. I'm a cognitive neurologist proudly at Macquarie University. Um, it's fabulous to have you online and fabulous to be here today. Dean, I think we've got quite a lineup. We do. There's plenty of people. So I'm going to start with a few acknowledgements because we do have some, uh, some fantastic guests joining us. Uh, first of all, the Honourable Victor Dominello, MP, Member for Ride, Minister for Customer Service. Professor, uh, Professor Patrick McNeil, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Faculty of Medicine, Health and Human Sciences here at Macquarie University. Mr Walter Komet, CEO of Macquarie University Hospital. Uh, Marsh National Sports Manager, Kirsten Mills. Clinical, Clinical Associate Professor Michael Buckland, Head of Department of Neuropathology at RPA. Uh, and Executive Director of the Australian Sports Brain Bank. We've got CEOs, directors, Chief Medical Officers and Senior Managers from various sporting agencies and services. Also with us today are Senior Industry Representatives, Medical practi uh, Practitioners, Researchers and Academics. Rowena, we've got a few supporters to thank as well. We surely do. Apart from Marsh Insurance, we've got GE Healthcare, Glia Diagnostics, Synaptive Medical, Australian Sports Brain Bank, Fujitsu, Men of League. And I'd like to put in a special mention to the Macquarie Uni team who's helped produce this, Brenton Hamdorf, Courtney Sullivan and Ian Brew. Thank you so much. A little bit of housekeeping. This seminar is recorded. A survey link will be posted on the chat at the end of the seminar. And we will be hosting three Zoom breakout sessions. So please hold on the line afterwards that you can contact us one-on-one -on -one and have a chat. Um, today we're going to hear from stories of both the injured and the families of the injured. Whatever discoveries we make today together, we are inspired by our Indigenous colleagues and the traditional owners of the land on which we study. Welcome. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of Macquarie University land, the Watamadigal clan of the Darug Nation, whose cultures and customs have nurtured this land since the dream time. We pay our respects to elders past, present and future. We welcome people of all nations and all faiths. Kwai Bidja, Jamna Payala Janawi. Come here, we speak together. We have 60,000 years of archaeological evidence of Aboriginal habitation at Lake Mungo and 20,000 years in Ride. We have great antiquity. Today, hundreds of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people graduate from Macquarie University. The Darug Nation had famous leaders such as Chief Yaramundi, Naraginji, Colby and Maria Locke. Many of the descendants of these Darug people live today amongst you. We celebrate with you our ongoing attachment and custodianship of this country. We celebrate the achievements of Macquarie University. I'd now like to warmly welcome the Honourable Victor Dominello, MP, Minister for Customer Service, Member of the Legislative Assembly, Member for RIDE. Victor is a senior minister in the New South Wales State Government and has held various portfolios over the last decade, including Aboriginal Affairs, Innovation and Finance. He was appointed the inaugural Minister for Customer Service following the 2019 election. The first of its kind in the country, this ministry aims to put the customer and the citizen first in, a, in the design of all government services. Victor firmly believes that, that the use of real-time data, digital innovation and technology are integral to the delivery of modern public services. And we warmly welcome him today. We're extremely thankful for his time, Minister Dominello. I, I, again, I begin by acknowledging country, pay my respects to elders, both past and present. Um, one of the things that we've learned out of COVID was that we need to value research and development a whole lot more uh, than just a plaything on the side. Governments really, and governments, industry, academia, need to really come together uh, and put a lot more effort into critical areas. Uh, as we've seen, the whole world has literally spent trillions and trillions of dollars this year trying to come up with a vaccine in relation to COVID. But there are so many more uh, icebergs, as I call them, that are out there, particularly in the health space, that we need to work together to unpack 
to, to understand more of. And the impacts of tra repeated traumatic head injury, particularly as it relates to dementia, is clearly one of those areas. You know, in, in, a, in a land where we idolise sports and particularly contact sports, this should be, in many ways, a test bed for the world in terms of uh, understanding the, the consequences of repetitive injury and the long-term impact of that. Uh, I, I am very, very focused on data and digital, and you know, I've even had my brain mapped uh, because I want to see what's happening inside this skull of mine. Uh, but I realise that in, in the years ahead, this is where uh, we can leverage our position here as a, as a leader you know, on the world stage. I'm about to give a Bradfield address tomorrow, painting out the future for New South Wales. And I talk significantly about uh, the diagnostics and, and the new techniques that we're using, particularly around e-health. So I'm really hoping that out of today's event, uh, we have a deeper appreciation for the work that needs to be done, particularly uh, by uh, the conveners of, of today. Uh, but more importantly, how we should take a lead role, how we should own the responsibility here in Australia as, in many ways, a contact sports capital um, to really drive um, this reform and understanding. So again, thank you for having me. I'm sorry about the earlier glitch. I wish I was there, but I'm stuck in Parliament today uh, in uh, no doubt having very very uh, educated debates uh, here in New South Wales Parliament in the bear pit. Anyway, again, wish you every success and I look forward to hearing the outcomes. Thank you, Minister Dominello. I think all of us have, have, have had a Zoom mute uh, issue in, in recent times. So you're certainly not alone there and we appreciate your time. Um, it, it's really fascinating to hear from your end um, and having your support in making New South Wales a leader in brain health and using technology and diagnostics to do that. I'd like to introduce now Professor Patrick McNeil, Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Medicine and Health and Executive Dean, Faculty, Medicine, Health and Human Sciences here at Macquarie University. Professor McNeil. Thanks very much, Dean, and uh, uh, thanks to the Minister for, um, for his uh, introduction and comments. Uh, it's, it's great to have uh, your participation, Minister, and, and uh, we know that you're very fond of Macquarie University because you're our local member and we're very fond of you. Uh, I'll just explain uh, my position at Macquarie University. I, I have a, a, a couple of roles. One is I'm um, the Executive Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Health and Human Sciences, and that's a faculty uh, where uh, our researchers, uh, including Rowena, do their work. Um, uh, and it includes you know, medicine, uh, a lot of health uh, professions, uh, psychology. Uh, so really everything that is needed to, to solve the problem we're talking about today. And my second role is a uh, leadership role as the managing director of MQ Health. Macquarie University is unique in being the only university that, uh, that uh, runs its own health service here on campus, MQ Health. And our, um, our motto of our work is heal, learn, discover. So those three words tell you how we integrate uh, the research we do, the discoveries we make uh, with learning and with uh, practice where we care for our clients and our patients. And the thing we do is bring those three things together. And I think um, we've got some very good examples of what we do both on the academic side and the clinical side. Probably one of the strongest ones is in neurosciences, the topic we're talking about today. It's a real uh, research and clinical strength here at uh, MQ Health and Macquarie University. Uh, people may not know that we run uh, Australia's biggest and most integrated motor neurone disease clinic uh, and have one of the biggest research programs in that area, uh, which is uh, another uh, neurodegenerative disease. We've, we've also got a very active uh, research centre in, uh, in uh, dementia, which uh, ranges from you know, very, very fundamental discovery research using uh, uh, models of, of dementia in, in, uh, in uh, mice, uh, right through to uh, integrated research studies uh, looking at uh, what we call pre-dementia or people who, who uh, are at risk of dementia and, and trying to find those key biomarkers and other um, measures to identify patients at risk and then start to look at treatments. So the topic of today, which is uh, repetitive head trauma, is another uh, one of those neurological conditions that uh, uh, fits with Macquarie's um, value set of ambition and innovation. This is a really emerging area that, uh, that is 
uh, des desperately needs uh, more, more interrogation, more discovery, uh, more care, uh, because it's increasingly being common. Uh, and so I'm really looking forward to uh, uh, the discussions today at, uh, at this uh, seminar. So once again, uh, welcome to Macquarie University. Um, thank you, uh, Minister, and, and, and also our sponsors. Uh, and I'll pass back now to uh, Rowena. Thank you very much, Professor McNeil, for those insightful comments encouraging our work here at Macquarie University. I think uh, certainly the words heal, learn, discover have resonated with me as I know it does with all the staff and students here. So I hope that we can move forward uh, very well together um, nationwide on this topic. It's very important. And um, speaking of important, we have now two Australian icons. They're certainly my heroes from childhood. We've got Jeff Fennick, um, world boxing champion, Olympian, and Steve Blocker Roach, NRL great. I hope you enjoy this video. Brent Todd in there to do some heavy work as Roach carries a couple of the Kiwi forwards with him inside New Zealand territory now. And this third test match, line side goes Sterling you running on American off. soil, the undefeated Jeff Fennec. And his opponent across the ring on my left, fighting out of the red corner is... To be honest, I always wanted to be what Blocker was. I wanted to be a rugby league player. Um, I got into boxing by accident and I was um, able to do amazing things. I went to the Olympics in uh, 84. I was world champion in 85. Um, you know, I was uh, the quickest person ever to win three world titles undefeated. My record was only broken last year. Well, I was just a young fellow growing up and idolising, you know, Bobby Fulton and Graham Langlands and all those sort of guys that were from Wollongong, where I originated from. And... Just watching all those guys and thinking one day, you know, I'd love to love to play in the same sort of arena as those guys. Oh, well, um, yeah, I can see my opponents tiring and hurting, and um, yeah, I want to, I want to finish a fight. I want to, I want to knock him out. Of course, I'm proud to win, but I'm not proud of, of hurting anybody anymore. I love being in that team environment. I love, I love going away on tours, and I, I love being around blokes who had the same sort of. Um, ambition as yourself, but just the fun times, the mateship. What sort of stage do you think, oh, I'm going to throw that white towel in now. Yeah, I am, because I've seen, again, I've seen the ramifications, I've seen some of my uh, close friends and I kind of think to myself, wow, there were guys I used to box, Steve, and I used to punch their heads in every day. I u we used them as, as punching bags. And look, today, I might sound fine that, but there were days blocked that I'd do something and 30 minutes later, I forget it, or I organised to do something at 12 o'clock and it's 11.30 or quarter to 12, it's five past twelve. God, I'm supposed to be somewhere. I just forget. And I mean, look, um, yeah, I don't want to put anybody else in that position. So we, we, we love this, but I mean, you know, yeah, we think that's great, but yeah, I don't know if it really is. That, that's what we've done, that's what you've done in the day. That's, it was a state yeah. of origin in those, in those days, that's how it was, you know, it was, it was sort of uh, get or got, get got, that if you were playing for Australia or you were playing in a state of origin, you were expected to try and take the opposition on, and that was just, I don't know, that yeah, was just part of it. You're expected to inflict hurt, that's, yeah. that, we're in the hurt game. Well, it's pretty hard to explain because you, <laughs> you don't really remember. I got asked the question a lot of times: How many concussions did you have? And I, but it's hard to it's hard to remember. But then the question was put to me: How many times did you see you know like the white dots in front of your in front of your head, in front of your eyes? You know, well that that would would happen would happen quite regularly, if not every week. So I don't know. The other thing for me too is is denial. I was in denial for a long, long time. Just you know, forgetting things and, you know, and my wife, my wife, Kathy, actually noticed it, but she never said anything to me because she wanted me yeah, to, she, she wanted me to come you. to her and say, yeah. you know, look, I'm having, I'm having a few problems, whatever, you know, memory and all that sort of stuff. And, you know, you know, talking sentences and, and like forgetting words during when, what you, you're trying to talk. But the thing that really 
upsets me is like I said, there are so many other people who just played second grade or third grade or reserve, and they need help as well. I don't want to see people suffer. I mean, you know, I've, I've got a lot of mates who have had a, a lot of concussions and all that sort of stuff, and, you know, to see them with their families and, and to see them not even wanting to get out of bed to go and to do a job, I mean... I'll tell you, know, you why it's so important. Let yeah. me tell you why. Because it's, it's quite simple that if something happened to Block a Roach or if something happened to Mario Fennick or to Benny Elias... We're all, we're all aware, we're, we're, we're aware of it and we're alert to that. But when it happens to Joe Bloggs while he played second grade, nobody cares about it. Macquarie University cares about everybody and that's, that's the reason why I'm sitting here. You know, we, we talk about suicide and we, we talk about helping a mate and talking to people. There's more to it than that. We've just got to try to make it as good as we can and um, look after the fighters. When I think of this fight, I think of total neglect from Jeff Horn's trainer. I thought that, um, you, know, um, you know, asking him questions and, and, and letting him you know, cop what he was copying, I'd like to think that um, the way I'd like to, to correct this is I'd like to put his trainer in the ring and let somebody punch him in the head so many times and see what it's like. I, I thought the towel should have been thrown into the third round. We need, we need funding and we need, we need the, the people who have made all the money out of you guys to, to give something back. The, the other thing we've got to do is try and, try and work out how we can afford to help those other people that can't afford to help themselves. That's, well, we a, that's the thing. No, so that's, and that's the thing that upsets me the most for winners is we can afford to help. The NRL make millions of dollars. They do a bi couple billion dollar deal with the TV. You mean to tell me they can't give some of that money to look after some of these people to help Macquarie University? When I, when I look at it, um, it's sad. We just need to um, have a, a better legislation. We need to have better people um, that allow these people to be trainers and referees and officials as well because mate, the referees... Um, the referees in some of the fights over the last few months have been just as bad as the trainers because they've let them go on as well. Collision sports and, and physical sports like boxing, I, I don't see how we're going to stop the collision. I don't see how we're going to stop. I mean, I think the whole thing needs to be looked at and um, as well as just the competing on, on, on game day or on, on fight night, we've got to also think about our training techniques and making sure that the, the, the young guys aren't getting hurt as they're growing up and well, getting concussed. We see it a lot now in rugby league too, now during the training. Like a lot of people only see the game day, as you mentioned, the game day where people actually go there and watch people play. But they have scrimmage every week. Scrimmage is is like going at a game, opposing your teammates and playing against, you know, playing against your teammates. And, and the instructions from the coaches and the people who are doing it is you've got to go as hard as you can. Until everybody's under the same banner and doing the same thing, and we're always going to have people trying to take shortcuts or people cheating, people getting away with things that because they because they want to win. I'd like to do it. I'd, I'd like to do it. Like if, if I was going to do it, do it privately and just have no fanfare really about it. You know. Yeah, well, I've done it, but I've, uh, and I haven't done it for fanfare. But I'm, I'm not sure they're going to find much oh, in my blog. They probably but won't look, look um, mine anyway. Yeah, I'm, um, I've always thought, ah, you know. Once you face it and you, you go and get the tests and you do all the things that you're supposed to do, um, it's, it's a weight off your shoulder. And you can see the relief in your family. Even, you know, I've got three sons, you know, and, you know, my wife talks to my sons about this sort of stuff too. And, you know, they tread around me even better now. Do you know what I mean? Like they understand that I know about what's going on. So it's a relief for the whole family. And they're the, they're the people you've got to think about. Like, if anything ever happened to me and I'm gone, you know, you leave your family there, you know, to, to pick up the pieces, and that's, that's not a good thing. How good was that? I love hearing from, from two of Australia's greats, uh, sporting greats, not only reflecting on their past and, and what they feel and, about that, but the, more importantly, the care they show for... For the, for the current and next generation, uh, and particularly for those outside the spotlight. Uh, I think all of us are involved, are involved from some sort of altruistic approach uh, where we want to see everyone taken care of and at least aware of what the risks are. I'd like to now introduce Dr Warren McDonald, Chief Medical Officer for Australian Rugby Australia, I should say. Uh, was is a former doctor of mine uh, at the Wallabies and he's a terrific bloke and I know he took care of me 
Um, and it's nice to know that he's in a position where he takes care of everyone in Rugby Australia, every player there. So, Dr Warren McDonald. Good afternoon, my name is Dr Warren McDonald. I'm the Chief Medical Officer of Rugby Australia. Uh, I've been asked to present today on the state of play in rugby. Uh, and by that, um, I am presenting a very brief overview of the identification and on-field management processes for sports-related concussion uh, in rugby. There's been an evolving proactive approach to concussion identification and management from all sports in recent years, uh, driven by the sports themselves, both uh, national and international uh, governing bodies, uh, but also driven uh, independent of sports uh, by collaborations such as the Concussion in Sport Australia collaboration uh, between the Australia, Australian Institute of Sport, Sports Medicine Australia, the Australasian College of Sports and Exercise Physicians and the Australian Medical Association. Uh, and this collaboration has produced a position statement and working documents uh, which are updated regularly as the science evolves and freely available at the website listed. Uh, within rugby, uh, we have several examples of, of the evolution of uh, processes around on-field identification and management. Uh, and I'm going to focus on two processes today. Uh, firstly, the World Rugby Head Injury Assessment Process uh, and the Rugby Australia Blue Card Process. World Rugby Head Injury Assessment Process commenced in 2012 uh, and the process has been constantly refined uh, over the years since then based on a constantly building research database. Uh, I think it's important to note that this process uh, uh, has limited access and it's only for high performance teams as I've listed uh, on this slide. But importantly, it's not used in the general community um, and certainly not in club rugby, in junior rugby or in schools rugby uh, for anyone or for anyone aged 18 or under. And the process at these levels of the game is what is known as recognize and remove. So the process is actually a three stage process uh, most people are aware of, or many people are aware of, the, the first stage of the process, which is an off-field in-game assessment, which, is a, which lasts for a mandatory 12 minutes and is a standardised process so that uh, the, the HIA used in the UK is the same as Australia, is the same as South Africa, is the same as in Argentina. Uh, but there are two subsequent pro steps in the process. Um, a same day post game assessment uh, and a third assessment uh, undertaken 36 to 40 hours post game. The diagnosis of concussion can be made at any time in this process, but concussion can't be excluded um, until all stages of the assessment process are completed. Uh, and access to the HIA process requires World Rugby approval, as I've already said, and is linked to a set of World Rugby Player Welfare Standards. It's linked to specific education for players, coaches, administrators and, and uh, medical staff. And it's linked to research, uh, which as I noted above, has been uh, undertaken for, for the, the eight years that it's been running uh, and which guides refinement of the process. So there've been several significant outcomes of the uh, head injury assessment process over the last few years. Firstly, there is a, a consistent approach uh, to the initial management of concussion across the world, which essentially involves a repeated multimodal assessment. Secondly, there's a consistency of what is classified uh, as concussion in rugby around the world, which again is, is good for management, but also uh, in terms of research. And then uh, thirdly, and, and most importantly, there's been a, a significant reduction in the number of players left on the uh, on the field who were subsequently diagnosed with concussion. Uh, back in 2011, this number was 56%. Um, in the 2019 data, which has not been published yet, uh, that number is well less than 10%. Uh, obviously, in an ideal world, we want that to be 0%. So let's now turn to uh, a process that's been used here in Australia uh, over the last few years. Uh, in our community game, uh, and that is the blue card, which is a, a card that the referee has uh, in which uh, the referee may order a player 
um, to be removed from the field of play uh, if in the opinion of the referee uh, they have either a confirmed or a suspected concussion. Uh, and this process was first trialled in 2017 and uh, then applied nationally in 2018. Um, it's a process that applies to uh, all community rugby from under 13s and older uh, and is essentially a public acknowledgement of a head injury having occurred and being managed uh, appropriately. Uh, significantly, this process doesn't change the laws of the game as, as the referee has always been the final arbiter of uh, who is allowed to stay on the field, uh, but it's in, involved a, a lot of education of players, coaches, match officials, medical staff, administrators, uh, the general public and, and particularly doctors. Um, and I guess the final point about it is that it's a translation of concussion procedures and processes to the community level of the game. Um, so we have processes that not only apply to the, lead, the, uh, the high performance end, but also to the community end. So as I noted, uh, the referee can use the blue card if to remove a player if they suspect concussion. Uh, importantly, the referees are not diagnosing concussion, um, but uh, if they suspect that uh, a concussion injury has occurred, they can remove the player from uh, the field of play and that player does not return that day, uh, which then triggers an off-field process, including uh, a mandatory minimum stand-down period and medical assessment. Uh, and we have uh, a central recording process of incidents uh, that allows us to analyse statistics. So the general principles of the blue card are, are that we are attempting to establish a collaborative, pro collaborative approach to the management of concussion. In other words, all parties are responsible for the appropriate management of a, an injured person, whether you are a coach, a player, an administrator, a match official or medical or first aid staff. Um, the management of the process occurs at the uh, competition uh, manager level, but um, difficult cases or places, cases that cause uh, controversy can be referred to the Rugby Australia staff and specifically my role as Chief Medical Officer or, or our concussion consultant uh, can, be, uh, can have their opinions sought uh, in the case of uh, difficult cases. Um, and then finally, um, the, there, are, there have been a couple of paradigm changes uh, that are at play. Firstly, diagnosed or confirmed concussion and suspected concussion are treated uh, identically uh, in this process. Um, and so that any player presenting with signs or symptoms of concussion in the presence of a potential head injury are considered to be suffering from concussion uh, unless an alternative a diagnosis can be provided. As I noted at the start of this overview, this is a very brief summary of just a couple of things that have been done within uh, the sport of rugby to improve the uh, on-field identification and management of concussion over the last few years. Uh, there is certainly a lot more to this story uh, and there's certainly a lot more information around the things I've discussed today. So uh, you can see that the World Rugby website, the Rugby Australia website and the Concussion in Sport Australia uh, website all have uh, are all sources of very good information uh, if you uh, wish to find out a bit more. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Warren MacDonald, for clearly a very detailed expert presentation on concussion. I know that you've been one of the strong leaders in, in this field of research and, and care for patients and, and, and players. So thank you very much for those insights. Um, now I'd like to um, propose a repetitive head trauma initiative. A um, hundred years ago, things were very different, of course. We didn't have dementia around so much. So this is Bondi Beach circa 1900, at which time the life expectancy for women was 51 and for men was 47. Um, these children would have faced famine, um, war, infections. So life was very different and around that time Alzheimer's was only just being reported in the literature. But now we have a, a high rate of Alzheimer's as, as we get older. So when you're in your 80s you've got a one in five chance of having a degree of dementia, the most common type of which is Alzheimer's. So this is a condition of our times and, and sadly my own uh, mother um, Carolyn had uh, Alzheimer's disease in her 70s so I well understand the marathon of dementia. 
Where are we today as far as, um, well, our, our, health is, our health is fantastic. You know, of course, we've got a much longer life expectancy and quality of life in many, many areas around the world. Um, we're now seeing, very pleasingly, the equality of women in elite sport and also right through um, the grassroots uh, through to grade levels. But we're also still seeing the ramifications of concussion in these contact and collision sports. And of course, it's very topical, as it should be, I think. And, and we're all calling for um, change and also putting our minds together to see how we can do things a little better. Who's getting injured? Who are we talking about as far as repetitive head trauma and, and a risk for CTE? Well, CTE has been demonstrated in, in a 25-year-old Rodeo rider and in these sports listed here. Um, so there's an expanding literature on this. Um, you'll note there the, the good work of um, Professor Michael Buckland, um, you know, recently identifying CTE in our own sports and, and triggering this um, debate. But CTE applies also to non-sporting head trauma. And what I note in, is that the literature is dominated by sporting-related concussion and head trauma, but the majority of head traumas are non-sporting. So we need to deeply consider this as we go forward. We see repeated head trauma in defence um, with blasts or, or rocket firing, for example, construction industries, farmers, so they often get a knock from livestock, falls from quad bikes, ladders, working with steel, for example, mining. And then we see a group of, of patients who have falls. And this is, I'm very familiar with these patients in my neurology clinic, those who are visually impaired or blind, those who are frail, epileptic, alcohol use disorder patients and those with Parkinson's disease, to name a few. So how are we testing them? Well, in our neurology clinic, um, what you may not realise is your doctor's probably analysing you from the minute you get up out of the chair, or a good neurologist will. It's the specialty of people, understanding the person and observing their, their every movement and their every social interaction before we do go on and do our tests like MRI and neuropsychology testing shown here. Um, so it's really putting together that puzzle, all of those pieces to understand the person and understand are there any concerns over dementia or decline. As you already know, I'm a big sports fan and I grew up in Canberra with all the codes, followed rugby. I didn't play it, it wasn't the done thing at that time. But I did go on to represent my state in four sports and I represented Australia in fencing and modern pentathlon. So I do know a little bit about what athletes are going through, as do um, quite a few members of our team. And I grew up with a neurosurgeon father as well, Dr Ray Newcomb, who helped lead this work. He led the NHMRC report into repeated head trauma and, and, and football injuries, as well as in boxing. And at that time, they called for a central fund for research into the prevention and management of head and neck injuries, particularly a uniform approach to concussion. So here we are again today, and I'm sure that we can do better um, together and really forward this work. And at that time, there was concern over, could there be cognitive impairment resulting from repeated head trauma? The Kiwis may beat us to it, as, as per, perhaps as usual. So we're really inspired by what they're doing. They, they have a different system, a different insurance set up for concussion, of course. But they have this rugby smart, smart program and starting to focus on good concussion education and good management and protocols. And um, Professor Buckland and I attended the launch of the New Zealand Sports Brain Bank last year, which was welcomed by some All Blacks, um, as seen here. So what are we doing in Australia? Well, at Macquarie University, we, we have the SNAP CTE study, which is aiming to recruit widely 1,300 participants over five years with analysis of biomarkers, neurological features, neuropsychology, neuro-ophthalmology, which we will hear about, neurophysiology and neuropathology to link it all and give us the final answer. We're measuring the patient's IQ and we're measuring their recent memory. Um, given the reported concerns of their, their family and themselves. And we're comparing predicted and actual mem memory scores. So what are we finding? Well, these, these groups are above average intellect. Um, we're finding the sportsmen are, are smart. They've got their sporting intelligence. But we are concerned about some difficulties of learning and retention. So they have cognitive impairment, which is highly significant on these measures listed here and very, re, re, very much reduced relative to their predicted levels, although I note that this is yet to work yet to be published. We also are seeing an early loss of insight. So insight is the ability to perceive one's own behaviour and personality. It's critical for the maintenance of social connection 
And a loss of insight is one of the core features of all types of dementia. It's one of the things that are a red flag in the neurologist's mind, and certainly I'm getting this red flag with these patients. The repetitive concussive injury we have found associates with a 40-year earlier onset of loss of insight. And the resultant economic loss and excessive burden on caregivers from this could be very serious. So the conclusions of the SNAP CTE study so far, soon to be published, is that players show evidence of acquired cognitive impairment. The testing was consistent with descriptions of cognitive decline and players need assistance. What do we do? What's the solution? Well, I think it's the National Repetitive Head Trauma Initiative coming together in a stage one cooperation as we are starting today for collaboration, hopefully funding and technology working together to see where we get to. With the research, we need to look at the risk of CTE, really understand that. But I'm proposing as well a repeat head injury assessment or RHIA, not just an HIA which is evident, will be evidence-based, perhaps an, an expert-led, perhaps neurologist, um, sports physicians, and in the older cohorts, geriatricians. And this will be linked to the Neuropathology Registry at the Australian Sports Brain Bank as a proposal. So here we see a diagram showing the HIA um, it, with the purple, but uh, an RHIA clinic beyond that, so sending our players uh, under protocol to these specialties can further assess the cognition, cognition by those who are really experienced in that and detect those sensitive changes of memory, mood and behaviour. And this will feed into the research clinics thereafter. So much like we have a mental health break um, in our community as very much an accepted thing these days, perhaps we ought to be having a brain break and sending them to specialist clinics and really allowing that time assessment and management. Here at Macquarie, we're very keen on innovative solutions, and here's some of the work of Paul Salmon and uh, Bianca De DeWitt um, looking at gaming technology. And there are, there's new technology all the time. Synaptive Medical now have a 0.5 tel Tesla MRI, so theoretically portable and certainly seems to be safe um, to be very close to it. And it's showing good images you know, which are very close to what, what you can attain on a three Tesla. So we're watching this sort of technology very closely. So stage three, once we have stage one and two, we can move to innovative solutions. We can look at screening using video technology, replays, real time field site assessments, and then eventually longitudinal assessments and longitudinal screening. A coordinated national registry, as has been called for on many occasions, coordinating, coordinating data out of the emergency department, general practice, the specialties, and working out the biomarkers, which will then lead us to the cure and prevention stages. So leading to earlier diagnosis, early intervention, and hopefully prevention of, of CTE and repeat head trauma related conditions for the longevity of sports, because they're great. So thank you for listening. I'll be back soon with some more information. Dean. Thanks, Rowena. Really interesting insight into uh, what's going on on the, the cutting edge of research, which uh, with you guys here at Macquarie are. And I think from my end, um, you know, sports so heavily publicised in this sense, but really it is a broader community issue. Uh, and there's many avenues that repetitive head trauma can come in. I think what is key out of there is there is an opportunity that exists to coordinate and collaborate on this across many, many areas around uh, the repetitive head trauma, whether that's in mitigation or, or further longitudinal yeah. research. I think so. We've all, all got our gig, all, all got our specialty, don't we? And I think we can really work together here. Yeah, totally. Looking cool. forward to it. Yep. Um, okay, I'd like to introduce our next video now. I'm, uh, I'm really starting to feel like the only person that's in this room that's not a doctor. So um, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of specialists here um, and, and it's going to be very insightful to see what is going on in, in the in the clinical research space. So I'd like to introduce on the video Associate Professor Jennifer Batchelor at Macquarie University, uh, Edmund Sorich, Director at Gleard Diagnostics, um, Rowena's sister, uh, Dr Virginia Newcomb, who's a neurointensivist at uh, Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge in the UK, Associate Professor Claire, Fis uh, Claire Fraser from Macquarie University, um, and all of the respective um, panellists or speakers here will provide their own insights uh, into the signs and symptoms of repetitive head trauma and what to look out for and, and what you can do about it. I've had
had a long-standing interest in traumatic brain injury and for many years have been working with individuals who have sustained a single traumatic brain injury. But the literature would suggest that repeated traumatic brain injury carries its own burden. Neuropsychology is essentially the study of the way different neurological symptoms affect a person's cognitive abilities, memory, attention, problem solving, etc and their behaviour. Uh, we're finding with the players that we've been seeing who have a history of repeated traumatic brain injury that they are demonstrating very specific difficulties on measures of memory and in particular measures of the ability to encode information into memory. So that's a very specific aspect of memory and different from the memory deficits that you see in many other disorders which are characterised by rapid forgetting rather than a specific difficulty of the ability to encode information. I think the future of uh, research in individuals with repetitive traumatic brain injury is trying to identify the individuals who are likely to be experiencing cognitive difficulties and behavioural changes and trying to improve health outcome through early identification. Around six years ago, concussion came across my desk and I thought, like most people at the time, why is concussion a problem? Um, people get knocked out in the football field all the time and they come straight back on. Uh, after some quick sort of research um, and a personal visit to Boston and speaking to Robert Cantu, I got quickly up to speed. Biomarkers are essentially what's happening at the coalface. If we can use the analogy of a canary in the cage, they're indicators of potentially what's happening and what's about to happen. Our markers, which are, which are called microRNAs, actually, there's three things we found. Firstly, the microRNAs clearly discern mild TBI versus normal presentations. They also quantify injury, so it actually stratifies mild through to severe. And probably most excitingly, they provide a return to activity tool, whereby we can determine if someone is actually safe to go back to do what they normally do. Prevention is better than cure. Um, there's again mounting evidence that undiagnosed or untreated mild TBI does lead to CTE. So the quest is really now to validate biomarkers for both mild TBI and for CTE. Um, so I've been doing traumatic brain injury research for more than a decade now. So I first moved from Australia to the University of Cambridge to do a master's in epidemiology and then I had the opportunity to do a PhD. So I'm very interested in being able to predict those who will have a poor outcome after mild head injury. And so my current research is focusing on that using both biomarkers and neuroimaging in order to predict this. I would then hope if we can actually work out who's going to have a bad outcome early on to then perform trials so that we can intervene and hopefully prevent that poor outcome from occurring. So CTE to me is really part of the spectrum of traumatic brain injury and it's just a repetitive mild head injury. Um, so I think it's a really important area that we need to look at but we should broaden it from just the sporting field and, and look at it as the whole spectrum of, of head injury. There are two uh, key facts that we really need to take into consideration. The first is that mild head injury is a misnomer, so over 30% of patients who present to an emergency department will have ongoing symptoms even two years after their injury. And the second is that we need to take into account the other injuries that a patient might have, so not just the head injury, as that will have a huge impact on the eventual outcome of the patient. So I think mild head injury is often a forgotten injury because people can't see it and yet it affects so many people around the world every year and it can affect any of us, so from, from young to old um, and can really be a life-changing injury and so we do need to do more research so that we can better look after these patients so that more people have a good outcome. I do neuro-ophthalmology which is diseases of the eye and the brain and how they affect each other and in my clinic I was seeing a lot of patients who would suffered from concussion either acutely or in the past who were having visual related difficulties. Interestingly about a third of the neurological pathways in the brain are related to vision whether that's either processing what you're seeing or then actually controlling the eye movements and what we started off by doing was looking at the measurements 
of what we call the retinal nerve fibre layer in the eye. And the retinal nerve fibre layer is actually a direct extension of the brain that can be visualised in the eye and directly measured, much easier than doing an MRI scan, for example. And what we found was that the players who'd had multiple concussions in the past were showing signs of thinning or damage in this area that could perhaps reflect what was going on in their brain. What we need to do now is to follow players or people who've had concussion forward and see what changes that we find early on are then a predictor of future trouble, whether that be related to their eyes, whether that be related to psychology or other neurological functioning. We don't want people to be afraid of playing sport because it has such great benefit for people's health, uh, for team building, uh, for making great friends. And so we want players to feel safe playing their sport, to know that they'll have the right diagnosis and treatment acutely and in the long term. So they, their parents, their family and friends don't need to be worried about the concussions that they get because we have the right research uh, to guide their diagnosis, treatment and long-term management. If you have suffered from a concussion or a head injury and you're having ongoing issues, whether that's related to your vision, your balance, headaches, your mood, anything that worries you, there are now doctors available who have an expertise and an interest in this area and we're more than happy to examine you, have a look and see how we can help. Sure you'll agree that was absolutely fascinating to hear from those researchers and I can't wait to see where this work goes in the next few years. I'd now like to welcome my good colleague, Associate Professor Michael Buckland. Michael is a senior neuropathologist and the head of department at Neuropathology, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, head of the Molecular Neuropathology Program at the Brain and Mind Centre, University of Sydney. And he's, clinical, he's co director at the Multiple Sclerosis Research, as well as the Australian Sports Brain Bank. And he's been an ever inspiring colleague. I met uh, Michael at the launch of the Australian Sports Brain Bank. So I'm looking forward to hearing his wonderful presentation. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Rowena. And thanks for the opportunity to, to speak today. Um, so I've been given the, the, uh, the task of actually talking about what is chronic traumatic encephalopathy and how do we diagnose it. So it's actually a neuropathological diagnosis. At this stage, the only way you can confidently diagnose CTE is examining the brain after death. And it's characterised by a distinctive pattern of an abnormal form of a normal protein in the brain, and that's called tau. So it's a distinctive pattern of abnormal tau protein accumulation in the brain. As I said, tau is a normal cellular protein. It's normally found in the nerve fibres and helps stabilise them. And abnormal tau accumulates in a variety of neurodegenerative diseases uh, in addition to CTE. And the most common one would be Alzheimer's disease where it accumulates along with beta amyloid, another uh, abnormal protein. Uh, but there's a whole uh, list of uh, frontotemporal dementias that also uh, accumulate tau. And some very unusual um, diseases such as post-encephalitic Parkinsonism, which is a disease thought to be due to uh, an infectious agent uh, and uh, was highlighted in the movie Awakenings uh, some time ago. Now, interesting, this disease seems to be an environmentally induced disease that turns out to be progressive and characterised by tau accumulation. Uh, such and it has a lot of similarities in that way with CTE. CTE is thought to be an environmentally induced disease, uh, induced by repetitive head knocks or repetitive brain injuries, uh, and it appears to be a progressive disease characterised by tau deposition. So these are some uh, some of my favourite pictures. I always like uh, microscope pictures. Uh, this is how tau looks like in a neuron on a standard stain, and it might be a bit hard to see there, but it's some purple stripes on the, the left of that uh, cell in the middle. Now, there's a, a wide variety of techniques we can use to highlight tau, and this is one of the uh, most well-used and well-known techniques. It's a silver stain, and tau is now being stained black by that silver stain in the panel in the middle. These days, a lot of modern laboratories, including our laboratory, use a tau 
antibody to stain the tau in the tissue. And that results in a brown stain. You can see on the, the right-hand side of the screen there, that's staining tau in neurons, as well as in the background in the nerve fibres. CTE has gone through uh, a few different names. Uh, most people would agree that it was the first person that probably described it, uh, described it as punch drunk in 1928. And that was by a medical examiner, Dr. Matt Harrison Martland in the US. He described a syndrome of uh, cognitive problems, movement problems and mood problems in X boxes and named it punch drunk. It's gone through a variety of name changes uh, over the years, um, but these days we know it as chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE. Now, prior to 2005, when CTE was described by Bennett Omalu in an ex-player of American football, there'd only been 42 cases of CTE reported in the medical literature. So while it was well acknowledged that it existed, it was very, very poorly studied disease. Subsequent to that, to 2005, um, there has been an explosion in research and uh, understanding of some of the pathophysiology of CTE. It's really been synthesised by uh, two publications out of the Boston University group uh, in the USA. Uh, in this paper in Brain in 2013, as well as this paper in 2015, 2016. And in these two papers, the, um, the pathological criteria for diagnosis of CTE at autopsy was laid out and then tested in a consensus meeting. And that's the criteria that uh, we certainly use at the Australian Sports Brain Bank, uh, as, as do many other groups across the world. And this is what it looks like um, uh, in a, a slice of brain. And uh, if you just look at that middle panel B, you can see what we're looking at is the brown stain. And the brown stain is accumulating in parts of that brain slice. It's really at the depths of the valleys or of the brain. So we all know the brain has got a lumpy, bumpy surface. And um, the valleys or the sulky of the brain tend to be the place where the tau accumulates. And that's a very distinctive pattern for CTE. And higher power microscope images show the tau seems to accumulate around small blood vessels at the depths of those valleys. And it seems that vascular injury may be an important part of the etiology of CTE. This is uh, one of our cases from the Sports Brain Bank. Uh, and I do apologise, there's actually one of my hairs on this slide, um, but it's a, good, uh, it's a good scale bar. And you'll see here, you can see the lumpy, bumpy outline of the brain. And you can see that brown stain really accumulating at the depths of the, of the valleys or the depths of the sulky. And just for comparison, this is uh, another um, donation to the Sports Brain Bank. But this person had Alzheimer's disease and this is their tau stain. While there's a lot of tau there, you can see there's no accentuation um, at, at the depths of those valleys. Uh, it's a relatively uniform distribution of tau over in the valleys and the crests as well. And at high power, this is another case from the Sports Brain Bank. Uh, and you can see on the top right, I've put some dots in to delineate the, the base or the depth of the valley, the sulky, and underneath that we have this irregular accumulation of tau in nerve cells and supporting cells and in nerve processes around blood vessels. So a very, very typical pattern of CTE. So what has been described in, uh, in America, we are certainly seeing here identical pathology here in Australia and in Australian contact sports. Um, Advanced CTE, uh, there is more tau, but I wanted to just uh, juxtapose two pictures here. On the left is severe CTE as it spreads over the surface of the brain, and it's got a very distinct pattern compared to Alzheimer's disease there on the right. So at the Sports Brain Bank, we've been operating for two and a half or close to three years now. Um, we have uh, 13 brains uh, examined to date from uh, sports people. And I just wanted to very briefly show uh, our work in progress, what, what we've found so far. So we've found, of those 13 brains, they're all donated from sports, donated or otherwise from sports people, or from a variety of contact sports, or other sports as well. Um, eight of those 13, we've been able to diagnose CTE uh, in them. Uh, and 
five of those have had Alzheimer's disease and not CTE, one with frontotemporal dementia. So when we look at an at-risk population here in Australia, in Australian sports, uh, it, we're finding it easy to find CTE at autopsy. Two things I just wanted to finish with. One of our cases was in a middle-aged male that passed away. He played rugby in high school and then he stopped. And in the few years before his death, he complained of some cognitive and emotional issues, as did his family. And uh, despite what we would think of as a, as a sort of a fairly normal exposure, uh, this man had stage two CTE. We're also seeing it in young people. Uh, and this is one case we found in a player in his 30s. He played at an amateur and semi-professional le level, but he had quite severe CTE. So we're seeing it in people that have an exposure uh, just in high school, as well as in people uh, that are quite young. So that's our website there. Please visit us and you can sign up for our newsletter for our updates. And uh, yes, thank you again for the invitation to speak. Mm. Thank you so much, Michael. So um, I think it seems neuropathology really is that window on the brain that we that we need at the end, end of the clinical work. And uh, it's so great to have you involved in this pioneering work that you're doing. If, if someone's concerned about any symptoms or, or wanting to talk about pledging their brain, how do, how do they go about that? So the best thing is just to visit our website. Mm -hmm. um, there's a contact form there. There's a, a, a button to tick to press if you want to uh, get some paperwork about donating mm -hmm. your brain and we'd strongly encourage everyone to do that. Mm -hmm. this, at the moment it, it's, it's a real numbers game and we've only just started to scratch the surface here in Australia. The way we're going to get good answers is through large numbers. So right. please everyone, I cool. encourage everyone, please pledge. Okay, so well, yeah, we can ramp it up and, and really get to the bottom, bottom of things, understand the risks. So thank you so much. That was wonderful. Thanks, Ryan. Um, I'd now like to introduce um, our next pre-record. Um, we've uh, got GE Healthcare, a leading global medical technology um, and life sciences company who are going to provide a broad... Um, who are providing a broad portfolio of products, solutions and, and services to aid in the diagnosis, treatment and monitoring of patients and in the development and identification of bi biopharmaceuticals. So we're going to hear from Dr Jerome Maller, um, MRI clinical science specialist from GE Healthcare to take us through. <laughs> My name's Jerome Maller. I'm a neuroscientist and MRI clinical science specialist for General Electric Healthcare. So for about the last 15 years, I've been focusing on advanced MRI, specifically diffusion imaging in the context of concussion or what some people call mild traumatic brain injury. So from the GE perspective, it all started with the GE NFL Head Health Challenge. It was a $100 million US partnership and it was an open innovation challenge to study mild TBI. The challenge one was methods for diagnosis. Challenge two was the mechanics of injury. Many submissions and hundreds of subjects were scanned, mostly sports people, football players, and healthy control subjects. A major outcome was the development of new MRI technology with a focus of detection on mild TBI and this led to the GE Cigna 3 Tesla Premier. So the developments are focused towards the study of concussion. It has to have a higher grade in amplitude as this equates to a higher resolution whilst maintaining signal to noise ratio. It also has to have a wide bore opening as the person has to be comfortable without the feeling of being confined. The hardware was completely redesigned to provide this higher gradient strength while also reducing its heating. By using this new hollow water-cooled gradient design, the MR scanner is far more efficient and can maintain homogeneity for longer exams. This new technology is particularly important for the study of concussion where damage is likely to be neuronal microstructure. That is, the new technology can provide images of very high resolution and it can do it fast. Typically, 
brain MR scans of people suspected with concussion do not show anything clinically significant, and that's because the damage, if present, is likely to be smaller than what we can see on the scan. So by imaging smaller voxels, that is, higher spatial resolution, we can see the brain in more detail. You can use hypersense, compressed sensing, higher resolution in a shorter amount of time. Here's an example of using hypersense on a 3D time of flight, which we call a TOF. This is using our newly developed 48 channel dedicated brain coil. If there are very subtle regions of microscopic damage, then these will be detected using this combination of advanced hardware and software. These data were acquired using the whole brain 48 channel air coil in a Sigma Premiere. DTI is a technique widely used to investigate whether there is any damage to microstructure after concussion. Here's another example. Note the very high level of detail and contrast with the white matter going right up to the gray matter gyral crowns, as we can see in this image here. We can measure parameters such as flow, vessel diameters, pressure gradients, speed, and essentially this can be achieved in a single scan. So if there are cardiac implications as a result of concussion, then they are likely to be detected using this technology. Here are some visual examples of 4D flow. We also have a compact 3 Tesla MRI scanner. Head only, extremely high slew rate, which means faster scans with less noise. Only 12 liters of helium, so no quench pipe is required. The gradients are 80 amplitude, and a huge 700 slew rate. It's very light as well, and it's easy to sight. This is a very high resolution DTI, 273 directions at three different B values. This is a very high resolution scan. So if there is microstructural damage to white matter fibers, which are often stretched and therefore damaged as a result of concussion, then this is likely to be detected using this technology. This really is a breakthrough in image quality. Using deep learning, the technology recognizes true signal from a noisy signal and uses only the true signals for image reconstruction. This new technology is particularly important for the study of concussion where damage is likely to be neuronal microstructure. That is, the new technology can provide images of very high resolution and it can do it fast. Thank you, Dr. Maller and JA for their contribution to understanding CTE through imaging. There's some fascinating stuff there. I think uh, Rowena and her colleagues probably have a fair bit of learning to do on how to use that effectively in the diagnosis. Uh, in our next clip, uh, I'd like to um, introduce three um, or a panel of elite sportsmen um, who over their careers experienced a number of head blows and are now seeing clear signs that indicate the long-term effects of repetitive head trauma. What are, uh, what are the challenges that loved ones face as well? We'll, we'll investigate this um, because we have um, a, a family member who's going to be um, explaining um, some of the issues that they're experiencing. Um, and also we'll, we'll touch on some of the fears that parents might have in relation to uh, repetitive head trauma in, in sport. So I'd like to introduce um, Dexter Dunworth, a retired professional boxer, uh, and was the world record holder for being the oldest professional uh, boxer in his time. Michael, Lip Michael Lipman, who a former um, uh, Australian rugby union player who played um, here in Australia, but also played a number of tests for England in the UK. Uh, I'd like to introduce also his wife, Frances Lipman, to talk about some of the experiences from a family point of view. Um, the panel discussion will be hosted by Peter Fitzsimons, who we all know as a, um, a long-time journalist and, and former Wallaby. Hello, I'm Peter Fitzsimons, and uh, this is a discussion about brain trauma among sports people and one spouse, of, uh, spouse of a sports person. Um, we're here at Macquarie University, where they've got a fascinating program looking at brain trauma, the effect that it has on sports people. 
how to deal with it, how to diagnose it, how to deal with it, what to do in the future, how Australian sport should sort itself out to minimise the impact of brain trauma. Brain trauma is not simply for people that have played for Australia or box professionally or whatever. It's for you know people playing subbies rugby, people playing amateur, doing amateur boxing. Is that it's not simply the knockouts that count. It's actually more 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 troubling. Is I think they call it subconcussive impacts. How often you are getting that, that constant bang, bang, bang in terms of training and playing. But go on, just for pure knockouts, how many times were you knocked oh, out? Okay, knocked out none. Oh. Seriously concussed six times. Right. When you're going on about the sub-concussions and, and getting hit, you would, I would spar every Friday morning for at least 15, 16 rounds where you are getting, no matter how good you are, you are getting hit a lot. Mm. And then that would intensify before having a fight. And then, um, so in that area of that sub-concussion, continuous hitting in the head, you'll probably get hit in the head maybe, I don't know, over the course of two, three weeks before a fight, maybe a few hundred times, which right. is pretty intense. Yeah. Knocked out and concussed. I was, I was thinking if I, if I wasn't completely unconscious, yeah, um, play on. Play off, 100%. So when I, was, when I was playing, I mentioned being absolutely knocked out was against the French in the first test in 1990, played on. And the coach put me back on, the doctor put me back on, and I wanted to play, play on. And I blame none of them. And, you know, the, the doctor, we had the, naive, the naive view that while boxers could get damaged, we were footballers, you know, and that somehow our brain would know the difference between a gloved fist, which was, da which was dangerous, and football running into each other. Whereas in rugby league, they talk about that a, a tackle in a rugby league, one man running flat out at another man hit, I'm told is the equivalent of being in a, in a small car running into a brick wall at 30 kilometres an hour with your seatbelt on. I know just from talking with friends and things like that, that in comparison to my schoolmates and friends that I have that have known me for mm. since we're at school together, that my memory is poorer than what it possibly should be. Right. And that concerns me. Mm. You know, Michael can still get quite moody and just sometimes you just, you, you're walking on eggshells because mm. you're just like, oh. Francis, among wives and partners, or yeah. how are you going? Yeah, well, we're just so lucky that um, Dr. Rowena has started a circle for partners and family members. Wow. And we had, um, you know, we had a meeting, um, a get together a couple of weeks ago and you know, there were tears. Um, there was a partner there that's had to leave, sorry, an ex-partner, because she had to separate from her husband. And, um, but it was also really encouraging just to have a, a chat and to realise that you're not alone and there are other people going through the same um, yeah. things. Once, once we sort of talked about the, the concussion or possible CTE, the light, Yep. So the light, it was like the light went on right. and we had all these answers for everything that we'd been explain, uh, experiencing. I think a lot of rugby league particularly will have real legal problems 20 years from now because there'll be, and, and maybe rugby union, I don't know. I personally would have no legal case against the ARU because I was in the hands of doctors and coaches who did their best just as I. We, it wasn't known. The danger now, the legal danger for these federations and sports is when they know and they still put them out there. You know, Michael's had quite a few cognitive tests and um, I, he had a score of 77 out of 100 for this. And I looked up what that meant. I thought, oh, that sounds awesome. And I looked it up and it was actually really concerning because it's at the stage of mild dementia. And I'm like, wow, this is what we're dealing with. And, you know, Michael's mm. only 40 years old. So I think it'd be really important, just as um, most schools now keep gym records and things yeah. like that, I think all That's this sort of idea. stuff needs to be documented at school when they're doing it, or junior level, whatever club, whatever. There needs to be a documentation of all kids on their medical side so that if they get they come off with an injury, what was it? It's on a record. Then 30 years down the track, if it's like a like us, we're playing at Joey's and all of a sudden, you know, you're in the Waratahs or whatever and you get injured or something, bang, they can put in. They said, oh, yeah, he's had consistently, he's yeah. had head knocks every, well, four years and then this one. So there's a, a pattern 
Dexter, the, the that's an outstanding very... idea, and I can't wait to write it in a column under my name. <coughs> well, there you go. Thank you all for tuning in. I hope this has been useful. I, I don't know. I, I, I'm impressed. Everybody's frankness, and I go away knowing more about it than I did when we started. So thank you for tuning in. Thank you again to all of our guests. Uh, Peter Fitzsimons, signing off. Thank you to those speakers. Um, not easy always, often talking about the fears that, that exist uh, moving forward. Um, as a former athlete myself uh, in a contact sport, this definitely resonates for me. Um, I also wanted to um, thank Francis in particular for addressing some of the fears of families and as they learn of CTE and other elements um, and just acknowledge that the, the Circle CTE program that's available here at Macquarie University, uh, which will allow people and family members to come and speak uh, about some of the fears that they have. Uh, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Alexandra Vuthi, um, who's going to speak to us on the need for a national funding network for player care, research and, and legislation. Alexandra is going to be a pre-record because she's joining us from um, Lausanne in Switzerland, where she's a, an attorney at Libra Law. She graduated um, in Switzerland at a master's in sports law and judicial uh, professions from the, yeah, from the University of Neuchatel. I probably said that wrong in Switzerland. So apologies in 2007. And she passed the bar there in 2009. Um, in addition to this, her international experience includes the completion of an LLM in sports law and common law and a PhD on the regulation of concussion in sport at the University of Melbourne. Welcome, Alexandra. So good afternoon, everybody. Concussion in professional team sports, time for harmonized approach. This is the title of my PhD dissertation. My research is based on case studies. It proposed a harmonized solution to better regulate concussion across countries and sports. So let's start with a geographical overview of the concussion controversy in professional team sports, class action and city cases. There were numerous sports uh, governing bodies sued in the US and Canada uh, during the past few years, including the National Football League, the National Hockey League, FIFA, USA Water Polo, and the Canadian Football League. Australian leagues are not spared either. Uh, there were several class actions announced in Australia, notably against the Australian Football League and the National Rugby League. And there are several uh, individual lawsuits pending against clubs in Australia. With regard to city cases, multiple city cases have now been diagnosed in team sports, including American football, Canadian football, Australian woods football, uh, football, ice hockey, baseball, rugby union, and rugby league. This is my research question. How can we reduce or prevent the public health risk of the occurrence of concussion, including its long-term health effects to athletes? And how can we reduce or prevent the consequent legal risk that we want to support governing bodies? The originality and significance of my research. So, so far, people had only examined the concussion issue within one sport, within one country. I come up with a harmonized solution. This is the first time things have been put together and analyzed in a critical way. And my research is uh, of great significance in terms of social, economic, uh, and public health viewpoints, and uh, not only for professional sports and professional team sports, but also uh, for grassroots sports. And the scope of my research, so I focus on professional team sports. This excludes elite sports, grassroots sports, individual sports, but um, my proposal will be useful and will indirectly impact these fields. Uh, structure content and methodology of my research. So in chapter one, I have an introduction. Chapter two, a medical overview. So I did interdisciplinary research. Chapter three, national case studies. So my national case studies focus on the most relevant and affected countries in sports. So I focused on uh, countries in sport which have a history of or potential for city and mitigation. This includes, of course, Australia. In chapter four, I identified general trends. 
chapter five, I propose harmonized reform. So I didn't want to start from scratch. That's why I use the anti-doping system as a guiding thread. Chapter three, uh, chapter six, a conclusion. And uh, the methodology, I use mixed method, doctrinal and comparative rule methods. My main findings in overall terms, so the controversy is expanding in terms of CD cases, in terms of class action. While sports governing bodies and to a lesser extent governments have recently made notable regulatory efforts, opportunities for further improvement exist. So right now governments are poorly involved and their action mainly focuses on grassroots sports and youth sports. So I really would like governments to step in because it's a public health issue. Current efforts are taking place within a framework that is too opaque, conflictive, defensive, and self-centered. And finally, harmonized reforms are urgently necessary given the ongoing nature of the concussion controversy across countries in sport and the need for sport to operate internationally. My proposed reform, so uh, anti-doping as a main source of inspiration, there are several similarities between anti-doping and the regulation of concussion. The most obvious one is the public health aspect, but uh, there are also differences between anti-doping and the regulation of concussion. For instance, anti-doping, it's about punishing. It has a disciplinary nature, whereas the regulation of function, it's more about prevention and compensation. So I had to be careful when I made comparison. And also I use match fixing and spect spectator violence as a subsidiary source of inspiration. So the main feature of anti-doping, as you probably know, there is a world anti-doping Agency, a World Anti-Doping Code, the WADA Code, um, UNESCO Convention, which is binding for governments, and the Court of Arbitration for Sport. On this basis, I propose uh, some reforms, uh, a World Sport Safety Agency, an international standard on concussion, which uh, could provide guidance for sports governing bodies regarding the rules of play, rules of the game, concussion management protocols, education, research, data collection, financial support to injured athletes, etc. In this convention for governments, again, like in doping, governments could uh, fund research, education, and like in doping, governments could withdraw their financial support for non-compliant sports organizations. And the Court of Arbitration for Sport could intervene. It shouldn't be a um, compulsory uh, intervention, but um, it could be of interest. It could be a good option. The benefits, so we go back to my research question. Uh, my reforms would reduce the risk of uh, injury to, profession, to professional athletes, reduce the risk of litigation. There would also be more transparency and collaboration between stakeholders. My reforms would bring uh, impetus and power of constraint from governments. Uh, right now, some sports organizations um, adopted a wait and see approach, maybe not in Australia, maybe not in the US, but in Europe, where I am right now. Uh, positive effect on grassroots sports. Think about FIFA. If FIFA adopts uh, new rules of play, it's going to trickle down to lower levels. And uh, my reforms will also have a positive effect on individual sports or even other types of injuries to an extent that will need to be determined by further research. Uh, there will be some hurdles of funding, like for every uh, important large scale project. We will also have to convince sports governing bodies to surrender part of their authority. It will be hard also to attract sports league, non Olympic sports because the IOC, the International Olympic Committee, has authority over Olympic sports only. And for Olympic sports, the IOC could say, okay, if you don't uh, follow these rules, you won't take part in the Olympic Games. But it wouldn't be possible um, for leagues, sports leagues. And finally, the challenge of sustaining a strong effect. Uh, of course, we don't want window dressing, so we need efficient measures. So my presentation was very short for further information. So you can have a look at my PhD dissertation, which is now available as a book. 
There is also a summary of my main findings and proposals available on Medium. It's a very short article, five minute read. A more detailed presentation is available. I did a presentation for Mercer Marsh benefits last July. So it's 45 minutes. Uh, it's more detailed and my contact details. I would be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Alexandra, for that very detailed, knowledgeable presentation. I think sometimes the best way to get things done is to bring people who are, who are a whole lot smarter than you together. And um, I really thank her for her different perspective in this discussion. Um, this is one of my one of my lovely patients, Dale Spriggs, who I was really surprised to see walk in through the door um, of my clinic because I'd known Dale when I was 14. Um, he used to ride horses for my mother um, and he was a top jockey, you know, he won uh, many races and a real champion and a champion person as well as his wife, Danny, who's shown here. And um, he really taught me a whole lot more than I, I knew about the jockeys already. He taught me that they were getting repeated head knocks from the horse's head, who can, that can be around 50 kilograms into them. They were getting knocks in the barriers as well to their head, apart from the falls and apart from just handling these, these you know, great big animals as well, they get knocks here or there. So lots of repetitive head trauma. And the thing about jockeys is they're very, very tough. Um, they're often distracted by other injuries such as fractures of the arms or legs or, or other things. And so um, looking at head trauma I think is really important in this group and encouraging them to come forth for care. So um, Danny has been, again, a, a very admirable, courageous spouse who's been there for Dale and um, helping, helping in any way possible the symptoms that he's experiencing. So the National Repetitive Head Trauma Initiative, how do we go forward from here? How do we kick some goals? Well, I think this is all about engagement and I'm just so thrilled that we are here engaging together. I think this discussion is really going to change for, from here. There are multiple stakeholders, of course, government and sporting associations, um, non-sporting associations, of course, domestic violence, for example. Um, we've got the insurers, thanks to Dean and others. We've got reinsurers involved, um, the medical community as well as um, commercial and any philanthropy out there. You know, I think this is such a common, pervasive issue of concussion. Now we need to look at that and also what it means for repetitive head trauma and CTE. So I encourage your involvement and please contact us if you're keen. The major goals will be in early next year launching a public seminar, um, similar forum but public, so that we can maybe share some initiatives and ideas with the general public going forward. And in 2022, I foresee that the National Repetitive Head Trauma Initiative will be well and truly up and running, I hope it is, and that we're well and truly into the work of the SNAP CTE study. And I hope there are many other similar projects nationwide to really get to the bottom of this. And beyond that, who knows, maybe there ought to be centres for National Repetitive Head Trauma. Um, so there are lots of ideas that we can pursue, but let's, let's pursue them together. Um, I really want to thank our team here at Macquarie and, and also my good colleagues in research, my collaboration with um, colleagues at uh, University of Sydney, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital, La Trobe University and, and many others. There are too many to mention, but thank you. We can't do this alone. And I really hope for the future generations that we go forward together. So thank you for listening. Please stay on the line. Dean, we've got some really cool breakout sessions, don't we? We do, yeah, we do coming up for, for you guys. Um, but firstly, I'd like to, to thank all of our speakers. I won't run through them because there's plenty of them, but um, thank you for your time today. And I hope everyone out there enjoyed it. Uh, and for people online, apologies for any uh, earlier things. We blame YouTube entirely and therefore Google. Um, <laughs> it's, yeah, these things happen, don't they? <laughs> but it will be, it's recorded, so you can share it with others and go back and look at these um, really fascinating videos. So um, we've got the breakout sessions. We've got the research group hosted by Michael Buckley, and I'll be there. We've got Jenny Batchelor. We've got imaging with Jerome Maller from GE. We've got my sister, Virginia. We've got um, others as well, Synaptive Medical. And we've got insurance. We've got Marsh. And I think we've got Hannah Varee. So stay on the line. Come contact us directly um, or down the track. Um, we'll be putting out some emails and further contacts. Last thing for me, just to thank our supporters for today who made this possible. So GE Healthcare, Glia Diagnostics, Synaptive Medical, the Australian Sports Brain Bank, Fujitsu uh, and Men of League and of course Macquarie University um, and all their staff for, that are facilitating this discussion and, and raising some further awareness on um, what we can do that and how we can collaborate and move forward. Fantastic. Thanks guys. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.